had suggested. And Jude's a, Jude's a funny little book, a strange little book. We're going to read the whole thing, and there's going to be stuff in it you're going to wonder about, what is that? But by the end, I hope you discover it's very relevant to our lives. It's very relevant to my church, Chevrolet Baptist Church, and I trust you'll find it's relevant to your church and your own individual Christian life as well. As Mark said, it's all about false teachers. A friend recently said to me, I I'm not sure what to do with all the passages in the Bible about false teachers. I mean, I guess we just wait around till they show up and then point to them. Is that what we're supposed to do? Well, praise God, I'm not aware of any false teachers presently in my church, Chevrolet Baptist. I, I, I trust, I pray, I, I assume there aren't false teachers at this moment in this church, right? Nonetheless, we're given this letter by Jude, inspired by God to learn from. And what's crucial to realize, I think, I think is that false teaching is always kind of nipping at our heels and always trying to draw us in. Here's why. Because false teaching and false desire work together. Belief and desire are always connected. And insofar as you and I have false, bad, evil desires in our hearts... It's always looking for false belief, false teaching to justify itself. You might even put it like this. False desires employ false belief, false teaching. You know, like a, a manager will employ workers to do the work, right? In the same way, False desire, bad desire, sinful desire employs false teaching. And I don't know about you, but I know there are still sinful, carnal, wrong desires in my heart. How about yours? And assuming there are, that means you and I remain susceptible to false teaching, false belief. I, I remember having lunch with a married man a number of years ago, and over lunch he said to me that he was struggling with doubts about God. And he was, he was a member of the church, and he had almost got to the point where he was ready to renounce belief in God, but he wasn't quite here there yet, and he and I were having this philosophical conversation, how do we know God exists, a very rational conversation. And towards the end of the lunch, I said to him, well, brother, I'm encouraged that in spite of these things, you're still being such a faithful husband. Can you guess where I'm going? A few weeks later, the elders brought him before the church on grounds of adultery and were asking us to remove him from the church for his adultery. Oh, I see what that conversation was really about. It wasn't really about belief in God, was it? It was about the fact that you want something and it's not your wife. That's the real conversation going on. His adultery and his apostasy were in partnership. They were working together. And the larger lesson here is there's always a relationship between desire and belief. And so let me, let me just address here at the beginning any kids who are left or any teenagers especially in, who are left in this room. Realize that as you grow older, you're going to want to have conversations with parents, with friends about whether or not Christianity is really true. And you want to have these kind of philosophical conversations. And those are good conversations to have. And what you're going to do as you get older, maybe get into college, you're going to look around to other kids like you, teenagers like you who grew up in the church, saying they believe Christianity. And some of them are going to start saying they don't believe in Christianity more. You're going to see them fall away. Here's what I want you to know. The real conversation is about their desires and about your desires and what it is you really want, what it is you're really after. And to help us understand this, we're going to take, well, you see in your handout, four lessons about false teaching from Jude. There's actually those four lessons and then five more, okay, that didn't make it into the house, so just warning. All right, so four lessons about false 
teaching, and then five uh, lessons about how to live rightly. Uh, let's just look at the text first, though, okay? It'll help you have your Bible open and look at it, and I'm going to refer to it again and again, so just keep it open. Verse number one, we, we learn this is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, and then a greeting, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then he immediately tells them his purpose for writing. Verse three, beloved, Although I was very eager to write you about our common salvation, that's what I wanted it to do, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And then in verse 4, he gives us the basis or foundation for why he, he wants them to contend. For, this is why I want you to contend, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Again, notice that word for. Why contend for the faith? Verse 3, well, verse 4, for or because certain people have crept in unnoticed. They call themselves Christians. They speak at Christian conferences. They write on Christian blogs. They're on Christian Twitter they're followed by lots of other Christians, yet Jude tells us that long ago they were destined for condemnation because they are ungodly. They're perverting the grace of God into sensuality. Then we get to verses 5 and 6. They provide an explanation, verse 4. So verse 4 is an explanation for 3. 5 to 16 are an explanation for 4. Okay, that, that's how it's hanging in together. Verse 5, I want to remind you although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. These people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, Understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reeds at your love feasts, and they feast with you without fear. Shepherd, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wide waves of the sea, casting up the phone of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. I'm not going to get into all the details of all of those illusions. It would, it would take too long. We're trying to, again, get the point of the whole book. But following these explanations of, of what the false teachers are like, which is why he wants them to contend for the truth, as I say, he then gives us three clumps of commands in the verses that follow, about how to contend for the faith. Look at verse 17, where he commands them to remember the apostles' predictions, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now here's the second command. Keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. 
and then a third set of commands. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And then Jude concludes his letter wonderfully in verses 24 and 25 with words of praise that should appeal to what we believe, but also to what we desire. We should desire being presented blameless and beholding God and Christ in his glory. He, he writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Okay, so that's, that's the big picture of the book. Jude has noticed that these false teachers have come in, so he writes them to contend for the truth in response to these false teachers and false desires, and he wants them to instead to wait for their true joy and their true glory. And to understand all this better, let me start with four lessons about false teaching. And Jude spends most of his time here, so we'll spend most of our time here. Lesson one, false teaching speaks for God, but denies God. False teaching speaks or claims to speak for God, but denies God. Look at verse four again. He says, certain people, these teachers, have crept in and noticed they pervert the grace of our God. So, okay, they're speaking of grace, but they pervert that grace into what? Well, into sensuality, a, a word which has sexual immorality in mind, and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So they, they claim to speak for God, I'm here to preach about grace. But they preach about grace so that they can pursue their carnal desires, is what he says. We see the same thing in verses 8 to 10. Yet in like manner, these people, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, blaspheme the glorious ones. And then verse 9, but when the archangel Michael Skipping down, it did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So there's a contrast there. What, 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 what's the contrast? We have the false teachers relying on their dreams. They're, they're claiming to offer a prophetic word. The Lord told me. The Lord said to me, friends. But along the way, what are they doing? Again, they're indulging their sensuality. They're insulting, blaspheming the glorious ones, that is, angels, as if they are God the judge. And, and there's a contrast, as I said, with the archangel Michael, who refuses to render final judgment even against the devil himself and simply says, the Lord rebuke you. I'm going to leave this to God. He, he, he's, there's a certain humility, isn't there? In the archangel Michael, there's no humility in these false teachers. False teachers teach their own ideas. A true teacher appeals to God's word. A false teacher implicitly or explicitly rejects Christ's authority. A true teacher leaves judgment to God. False teachers speak instinctively based on their, based on their gut or the desires of their gut, about things they don't actually understand. A true teacher is modest and simply gets up in the pulpit on Sunday and opens the book and says, "This, friends, this is what the Lord says. And sometimes you hear strong Bible teachers and sometimes people accuse them of being proud and the irony is, the most faithful Bible teacher is the most, even if he's speaking with the conviction and authority, is the most humble man of all. Why? Because he's submitting himself to this book. Uh, people these days in Christianity sometimes appeal to their dreams. Uh, more often, you'll hear things like, as I just said, what God told me. Sometimes I'm introduced and there's this kind of Christian habit in some circles of saying, 
Jonathan, tell us what the Lord has placed on your heart. Well, you should be less interested in what the Lord has placed in my heart and more interested in what he's revealed in his book. And as you guys are thinking about your next preacher, pastor, whomever that might be, that, that's what you're looking for, a man who's interested in the book. Very often, false teachers present themselves ironically as humble. They'll make a show of being modest, but the whole time, as I say, they're appealing to their instincts and wants. They'll say things like, who am I to say who God loves and doesn't love? Uh, who am I to say that Jesus is the only way to know God? Uh, none of us can claim to know everything. Uh, don't spend so much time worrying about those doctrines that just make Christians argue. And what are they doing in those kinds of claims? They're telling you not to trust the book. They're telling you to trust them and whatever comes next. Friends, look for those pastors, elders, teachers who submit themselves to the book. Whatever God says is what I believe. We might have a hard time sometimes understanding this book, but we're going to aspire to know this book. That's our job. That's how we contend for the truth. Lesson two. False teaching appeals to our sinful desires and justifies them. False teaching appeals to our sinful desires and justifies them. Again, there's this relationship between desire and belief. Sinful desire nearly always comes first and then employs false belief. You see this throughout the letter. Verse 4 talks about using God's grace as an excuse for sexual immorality. Does your heart ever do that? Verse 7 refers to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah indulging in sexual immorality and pursuing unnatural desire. Look at verse 8, refers to defiling the flesh. Look at verse 15, refers to deeds of ungodliness. Verse 18 refers to the scoffers who follow their own ungodly passions. Verse 23 refers to the garment stained by the flesh. It's, it's all throughout this text, isn't it? This, this little book is shot through with references to sinful desire as the engine of unbelief. And there does seem to be a special emphasis on wrong sexual desire, which is to say the very thing which God gave us as a gift to anticipate what knowing him and intimacy with him would be like in the new heavens and the new earth, sexuality pointing towards that knowledge of God in Christ, we take that thing as a, an excuse, that gift that is an excuse to deny him. The ironies of that, the tragedy of this. Uh, some of you might have heard of or even read the famous 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell. Uh, Bertrand Russell spent his career arguing against belief in God. Russell's life was also characterized by multiple marriages and multiple affairs. He was known for being quite the womanizer. He took advantage of women throughout his life and spent a career developing a philosophy that justified that. And we call him one of 20th century's greatest philosophers. What a tragedy. Uh, not long ago, I was speaking with a Christian friend who was struggling with doubts about the faith, and I said to him, let's just back up and ask the question, friend, what is it that you want? What do you really, actually, ultimately want? And he looked at me like, why are you changing the subject? What, what, what does that have to do any, with anything? And I went on to explain to him, well, we don't rationalize our way to truth. That's not typically how human beings work. Rather, there are certain things we want and we rationalize our way to getting those things. We employ our reason that God has given us to get those things that we most want. So I'm just asking you the question. I want you to stop and not just think in your head, but kind of look into your heart for a moment and ask what it is you most want want. And friends, I'd say the same to you. 
What is it you most want? Is it the desires of the flesh or the desires of the spirit? The approval of man or the approval of God? If you most want the desires of the flesh, the approval of man, you will eventually change your religion. Even if you're still calling it Christianity. At that point, you're just a false teacher, which is who Jude is warning us about. In other words, friends, throughout this sermon, throughout this text, you're not just to be looking for false teachers out there. Okay, who in the church is a false teacher? Rather, you're looking for your own fallen flesh and how it might lie to you and tell you that you deserve something. You're entitled to something. You have a right to something. You love something. And it just seems fair. And, and they get... Lesson three. False teaching flatters you, but doesn't bear fruit. It flatters you, but doesn't bear fruit. Look at verse 16. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. When, they, when things don't go well, they complain. Otherwise, they're boasting themselves and flattering others to get what they want. Often there are two ways that false teaching gains traction in a church. Number one, through evangelistic impulses. Look, if, if we downplay these things here, they're more likely to accept us. Or, number two, through friendship and affection. Look, I know... He's not the greatest teacher. Sometimes he says things that are a little off, but he's a great guy. I love him. I know he loves Jesus. God will use bad for good. Think of Joseph. Satan will use good for bad. Good, evangelistic desires, loving somebody else. Satan will use that for bad. Be aware of that. In the meantime, this false teaching doesn't produce fruit in people's lives. Look at verse 12. They're, these people, are, they're like hidden reefs. Uh, they, they hit the ba- boat. You can't, you can't see it as, as the boat tries to go over it. They're, they're shepherds who only feed themselves. This, this pastor's reputation seems to grow as the people grow weaker. They're like clouds with the appearance of substance, but they don't really give life-giving rain. They're trees that don't bear fruit, certainly it's a heavy warning to me, as somebody who goes around teaching this book, it's a, it's a heavy warning to your elder and elders, it's a, it's a heavy warning to any man who you would call to lead this church, to any one who aspires to be an elder, to any woman in the church who, who is teaching Bible studies or, or wanting to lead other women. Why are you wanting to lead? Is it status you want? Is it prominence that you want? Or do you genuinely, genuinely desire good in the lives of others? Are you happy not to get recognition, not to have your name named? Oh, I just want these people to grow in grace. I want the girls in this Bible study to grow in grace and life and Christ likeness. I, I want this congregation to, to look more like Jesus and follow after him and sharing the gospel. You don't have to name me. That's fine. What is it you desire? Or let me ask it this way. After somebody has been one of your friends for a while, do they look more godly? Do they gossip less? Are they better spouses? What is the effect of friendship with you? What is the effect of an evening spent with you? Is it bringing life? Or... Are you this cloudless, or this, this cloud, rainless cloud? Oh, you know, there's a lot of substance. Ah, an evening with me. But there's no life-giving nourishment, finally. Verse 13, wild waves of the sea casting up foam. Foam looks like it has substance, but put your hand in it. There's nothing there. It's finally deceptive. Again, what's your effect on others? Lesson four about false teaching. False teaching focuses on today 
and forsakes tomorrow. False teaching, that is to say, is like a two-year-old. I want what I want now. I'm not thinking about the consequences, right? Verse 5, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains. They weren't thinking about those eternal chains and under glooming darkness until the day of judgment, the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire that now they're serving as a punishment of eternal fire. So verse 5 is recalling this Exodus story and what happened. They, they got out into the wilderness and they forgot what God had given them. They'd forgotten the judgment that would come. They were thinking about their stomachs right now. Verse 6 appears to be an allusion to Genesis 6 and the angels which left heaven, left the spheres of authority God had given them to have unnatural relations with women. Jesus judged those as well. They weren't thinking about judgment. Verse 7, actual illustration of judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah pursuing wrongful desire. They're now being judged. The stakes are high indeed. Judas showing up and saying to this church, hey guys, forest fire level red here. Judgment is coming. If you're giving yourself over to these wrongful desires, you're thinking about now, you're not thinking about then. What, what, is, what does this sound like today? Well, it sounds like the psychologist or the college professor or TikTok saying that our, naturals are, our, our desires are natural, our desires are good. Be honest about your desires. Don't repress them. That, that leads to shame and self-loathing, even trauma. And, and God's love and grace, don't, don't you see? God's love and grace is about self-acceptance, accepting others, acceptance of our children and our children's desires. That's what God's grace and love are all about. Well, again, Jude walks up to this, grabs him by the shirt and says, friends, do not be deceived into this false believing because behind this false believing and false teaching are these false desires. Yes, sex is a wonderful gift. Read the Song of Solomon. Yes, teach your adolescent children that those growing desires are, are God-given, but they need to be trained, instructed, corrected, not given over to indulgence, selfishness, converted into sensuality. You have know, the promise of judgment in verses 14 and 15 too. It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly, ungodliness of all their deeds. It is an immature mindset that measures everything according to how it feels, seems, looks, now, that is immaturity. That is two-year-oldness. And as we grow into spiritual maturity, like a child grows, we, we begin looking for longer and longer time horizons. By the time you get to five or six, you're able to think, ooh, if I just, mom said, if I, if I do my work, then I can watch the show or go play. So a two-year-old's got like, what, a one-minute-long time horizon? A five-year-old, maybe a, a one-hour time horizon? You get into your teen years, and you realize, okay, i got to work hard through my teen years to get into college. i got a couple-of-year time horizon. You get in your 20s, and you start thinking about, okay, well, if I'm doing this year, and I get married, and, and then this is going to happen in a decade. By the time you're in your 40s and your 50s, you're thinking about retirement. What, what is all of that? Well, that maturity means longer and longer time horizons. What is the most spiritually mature person thinking about? Eternity. Judgment day. Don't know when it's going to come. Maybe a million years from now. But I'm measuring everything in my life right now according to that. That final judgment day. Friends, that is Christian maturity. Not trying to justify things right now. 
Okay, that was four lessons for false teaching. Here are five lessons about what we should do. This will be much shorter based on how much ink Jude has spent on this. You can write these down, squeeze them in the margins or something if you want. Lesson one, contending against false teaching is every member's job, every one of you. Contending, oh, there they are. Contending against false teaching is every member's job. I think we see this in verses one and three. Verse one, he's not writing to pastors, he's writing to Christians. And then verse three, I found it necessary to write peeling to you to contend for the faith. Contending for the faith is not just the job of the pastors or the elders or the teachers, those who have been to seminary, those who have been ordained. Contending for the faith is the job of every believer. If you call yourself a Christian, one of your jobs is to contend for the faith. How do we do that? Verses 17 to 23, number two, lesson two. Remember the Bible's predictions. Remember the Bible's prediction. Verse 17, remember, beloved, the predictions of our apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. We should expect false teachers false desires, false voices in our own heads calling us to wrongful desire. Don't be naive, in other words. I knew a guy in seminary who called himself a heresy hunter. And I've known a lot of people on social media who seem to think they're heresy hunters. I'm not talking about that kind of posture. Rather, I'm talking about the war that is just always ongoing for our hearts and minds. And you need to be aware of that war. Remember the apostles' predictions. A friend of mine from a non-Christian college friend of mine was emailing me not long ago telling me about <clears throat> another friend of ours from college who just went to prison for fraud. And I replied in my email something to the fact about, how oh, well, we should never be surprised when people stumble into dramatic sin because that potential is latent within all of us. And he then replied to me, you probably recall that I am not religious, but something I've noticed over the years, he's in the army, something I've noticed over the years is that chaplains in the army are always the least surprised when otherwise decent people make appalling and exasperating choices. To take it a step further, the more thoughtful chaplains expect these events with some frequency. I've, I've never heard of them saying, them say a variation, huh, I never would have expected this uh, sort of behavior from that guy, or dang, I didn't see that coming. You know, the kinds of things I would usually say, which of course seems in keeping with their understanding of sin and human nature. These army chaplains remembered the apostles' predictions. And I think they served as a witness to my friend, to my non-Christian friend in that. So should we. We should expect false teachers. Lesson three, keep yourself in God's love. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Notice if you're just looking at the grammar of verses 20 and 21, the main command is to keep yourself in the love of God. Okay, does that mean keep loving God or keep knowing that God loves you? I think it's both. I think it's both. The Israelites coming out of Egypt presumed upon God's special love for them and they took it for granted and they stopped loving God. Friends, our hearts too can presume upon the love of God, begin to take it for granted. Our own love grows dim. So Jude tells us to keep ourselves in God's Love, Like you might say to you, a husband, keep loving your wife. Don't presume upon her love for you, lest her heart grow embittered. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, specifically, the author gives us three ways of doing it, three participles, building, praying, waiting. Building, praying, waiting. Look at verse 20 again. We keep ourselves in the love of God by building yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. And then verse 21, by 
waiting on the mercy of Christ. Let's, let's think about each one. Keep yourself in the love of God by building yourself up in the faith. That doesn't mean looking inwards. That means building yourself up in the, the doctrine, the teaching that we as Christians understand to be the gospel. The verse is telling you to grow yourself in your understanding of faith. It's telling you to attend church weekly, to put yourself under good faithful teachers, to study the Bible, to read the Bible, to rehearse the gospel. Build yourself up in the faith is what it is saying. I spend a lot of time with other Christian men, and I can tell you there is basically a one-to-one ratio between those who are studying the Bible and growing in the faith and those who just don't really have time to study the Bible and tend to be plateaued or even weakening in the faith. One-to-one ratio between those things. We need to rehearse the gospel as a church weekly, as an individual daily. What is the gospel that we rehearse? We'll look at verse 25, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came to live the life that we should have lived but didn't as sinners and died the death on the cross that we should die. We should receive the wrath of God, but he took that penalty on himself in his person, rose again, defeating the the powers of sin and death so that all who would turn from their sin, put their trust in Christ, follow after him, can have new life with this one who has been given all dominion authority, majesty, and glory. What what is the gospel? The verse doesn't quite say it this way. Other passages in the Bible put it this way. It's that Jesus shares his own glory and majesty and dominion and authority with us, his people who have repented and believed in him and followed after him. All the goods that he's earned, he shares with us, his people. That is good news. What is it you most want? I said to my friend, do you most want the desires of the flesh right now? Or do you most want the glory, the majesty, the dominion, the authority that have been earned by Christ and are given to all those who repent and believe? If you want to keep yourself in the faith and build yourself up in it, Rehearse that daily. What is it I most want? Things right now or the glory of knowing him? Uh, Second, we keep ourselves in the love of God by praying in the spirit. Our knowledge of the gospel turns into prayer. We pray according to his word. Third, we keep ourselves in the love of God by the waiting for the mercy of Christ, by posturing our hearts towards heaven. Think about it like this. How do children behave before Christmas? A little bit better, right? Right? They're focused, they're behaved, something's coming, they know it. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? You wait for the good things that you know are coming. So ask yourself, friend, does your own heart feel maybe a little dry towards the Lord? Have your affections grown a little dim? Well, have you been daily rehearsing the gospel? Have you been focused on the goods that are coming? Have you been giving yourself daily to prayer? Uh, If the answer is no, is it any surprise that your heart feels a little dry? I feel distant from my spouse. Well, have you been pursuing your spouse? Have you been loving your spouse? Well, no. Well, your heart's going to feel a little dry. I feel a little dry towards the Lord. Well, have you been reading scripture? Have you been attending church? Have you been talking about the gospel with your fellow Christians? Well, no. Well, what do you expect? It's not like there's some mystical, amazing moment that eludes you in the Christian faith that if you could just get there, you would, ah, now I'm inside the love of God. No, it's just a slow, daily, plodding faithfulness of building yourself up in the faith, praying in the spirit, waiting for Christ. That's how we keep ourselves in the love of God. Lesson four, show mercy to others. 
Verses 22 and 23, have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. You have doubters. Friends, if you struggle with doubt, share that with brothers and sisters in the faith. Talk about that. That's normal. And if somebody shares doubt with you, don't panic, lean in, show compassion. Remember, it's not just their head, it's their heart and what their hearts are desiring. You have this second group of people, they're falling even deeper into bad teaching and living. Is this a safe church for me to come if I'm stumbling into sin? Or do I have to pretend if I come here to be really good? And then this third group of people who are healthy, but even they know that they're at risk. So even as they're showing mercy, they're taking care of themselves. We can be cavalier and standing near sin. Friends, contending for the faith, fighting against false teaching means being involved with other people. It's not something you do in yourself. And I read a lot of books. I read all the theology books. No, it means being involved with my fellow church members. It means putting people on my weekly calendar making appointments, trying to squeeze them into my life where I can. It means when, when this service is over, you don't just rush off. You take a few moments to get to know at least just one other person, a little bit more. That's how you contend for the faith. Lesson five, finally, rejoice because God will keep us. Rejoice because God will keep us. Verse 24 again. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Back up in, for a second. Look at verse 21. We're told to keep ourselves. That's a command, right? Look at verse 21. Keep yourself, command. But now go all the way back to verse 1. Jude is writing to those who are called, beloved, kept. That's a word of assurance. And then look again at verse 24. He is able to keep us. A word of promise. You and I fail to keep ourselves in the love of God. Gratefully, our love for God is not like God's love for us. We don't do a good job of keeping ourselves, but he keeps us. And this may be the most encouraging word to conclude this little book and to conclude this sermon that we can imagine. We get up, we go to school, we go to work, we know we're supposed to keep ourselves in the love of God and contend the truth, contend for the truth, but we know finally we don't, but we know that he keeps us. There's another way to put the good news of the gospel. God keeps us when we are his because we forget and fail. And Jude shows up and says, oh, friends, rejoice. God keeps you and is able to keep you. You're called, you're beloved, you're kept. So there's a command, keep yourself. That unsettles us. But then there's a word of promise. He keeps you. And he is able to keep you. So after a sermon like this one, you might be tempted to say, Jonathan, I've not been keeping myself in the love of God. I, I know I'm susceptible to sinful desires and the false teaching which justifies them. I, I can look back on the times in my life when I had more zeal for the Lord. Man, I was like, I remember when I was 22 and I was praying a ton and I was reading the Bible and I was excited about the faith and these days I confess I'm busy, I'm distracted. It does seem like I don't love the Lord like I, I once loved the Lord. Now you're commanding me because Jude's commanding me to keep myself in God's love and I want to, but it's so hard. What do, I, what do I do, friends? The answer here is actually pretty simple. Look at the first three words of 24. Verse 24. Now to him. Look to him. Walk out of here and look to him. This week, when your heart seems dry, look to him. He is the one who is able to do it. Look to, don't look to me. Look to him. He is the one who is able to present you blameless. I'm not blameless. I trust you're not blameless. 
But you and I are called to look to him because through his death and resurrection, he cleanses us and presents us blameless. Look to him. Look to him with great joy. He is the only one who can give joy. So friends, we look to him. Start there. Walk out of here. What do I do? Look to him. Tonight, tomorrow, Monday, this week. Pray, wait. Look to him, pray, wait. That's the Christian life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you all praise because you are the one with all majesty, glory, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And you are able to keep us blameless and to present us to the Father in heaven with glory and great joy. We aren't blameless. We confess that. But you will, through your death on the cross, present us as blameless. And so your joy can become our joy for which we give you all praise. In Christ's name, amen.